This is Bliss by Lee Bobbitt. And this story uh, has a really good understanding of drug dependency. Uh, it's a good story. Okay, this is Bliss. Sam dragged his sister Elizabeth out of the tenement on a bright December day, her face swelling from bruises and puffed red with tears. She didn't speak when the cops cuffed the shouting, swearing, stereotype of a beater she'd called a boyfriend. Sam had given him a right hook to the face for symmetry's sake, and now the jerk was none too happy. That same hand wrapped so firmly around his sister's thin arm he felt almost ashamed. His wrist hurt. There'd been something about those neighbor kids who'd been staring with wide, knowing eyes like it was something they saw every day. I shouldn't have hit him. I'm better than that. Elizabeth didn't speak as Sam piled her into his car. She shivered and stared blankly at the house that had been hers, no evidence that anything was sinking in but the tear tracks on her face. Neither did Sam. It was enough to concentrate on the road and hold the wheel with that sore wrist, one stoplight at a time until they reached his condo. Last time it had just turned into a fight, another flight back into God knew where, now another call from the cops, another lie, another lie he'd have to tell his mother about knowing where Elizabeth was. He wasn't going to ask why this time, and he wasn't going to judge. It was her life. He gripped the wheel tight and kept driving. When he helped her out of the sedan in the parking garage, arm wrapped firmly around her waist to hold up that too frail body, she started to sniffle again. He could have sighed, or slapped her, or cried. Why didn't you call me? If something was wrong, you know I wouldn't tell Mom, or why didn't you call? He made me so happy, she whimpered. Fuck, thought Sam. She was back on the bliss. Sam called his boss when they got upstairs. He had a family situation. He knew they were riding a deadline. Could he please have a few days to deal with it? He'd work overtime later. Madison hemmed and hawed, finally agreed. Sam thumbed the off button before he could change his mind. Elizabeth was shivering on the black leather couch, poking wide-eyed at the remote control for Sam's entertainment center. She looked just like those kids had when Sam's fist connected with that bastard's face. Curious, uncaring, totally detached. Liz, you want something to drink? She didn't even look up. He went into the kitchen. Black countertops and black on tile, white tile, shiny white fridge and stove, poured some water into a sweet heat-saving mug. His hands trembled as he replaced the pitcher in the neatly ordered fridge. He should call his mother, find a rehab program. He was the younger one, shouldn't have to take care of her again. She was a junkie and a runaway, what Madison called a gutter grubber. She chose the gutter. It was her own fault she had that shiner on her face. I am not my sister's keeper. When he got back into the living room, she'd managed to turn on the digital stereo. Music started to sprinkle out of the speakers. It was an old band, some two guitars and a drummer thing, not the incomprehensible anarchy of sound that passed for music these days. Elizabeth stared like a newborn child at the speakers, then clapped her hands and burst into tears. Sam rushed over, abandoning the mug of water on his coffee table and enfolded her in his arms. She was trembling, crying, snot running down her face and under her cracked, chapped lips. It took him a moment to realize they were tears of joy. Why did you start again, Liz? You promised me, he whispered. It was all he could do not to cry himself. She pulled back, shook her head, still dreamy looking and empty and not at all herself inside. You wouldn't understand, she said. There was no malice in it, just simple, clear, stoned out of your skull fact. The words punched him in the stomach and left a hole clean through to the other side. So he stood and picked up his briefcase from where he dropped it that morning, worked out the bugs and five pages of code until he felt soothed once again. The rest of the day she stared at everything as if it were a jewel beyond price. On Tuesday, she shivered and furrowed her brow, wandered the condo aimlessly, touching white walls, black lamps, white shelves, and the black TV, a hound scenting that something was not quite right. Sam watched her from the desk and wrote one sentence of her report over and over again. The evening news was full of the pharmaceutical question, tired-eyed policeman, featured a documentary on the use of bliss as a date rape drug. He turned it off halfway through. These problems had no numbers, too many variables, no controls. He made his head hurt and set an ache moving in his chest. On Wednesday, she curled up on the crisp white sheets of his bed and stared at the ceiling, black-eyed with despair. She spoke only in a monotone. Sam had to feed her himself. One spoonful of runny soup at a time from the heavy chrome spoon in his hand. 
She turned her face away after only a few bites, even though her stomach still rumbled and fussed. He talked in a soft, patient voice to her and massaged the food down her throat. By Thursday, the worst of the withdrawal was over, and Sam went back to work. There was a memo on his desk when he got into the office, tired, wondering if he shouldn't have spent another day at home. Report to the lab for seasonal testing, it said. It was two days old. Mac Burns clucked his tongue and straightened a wrinkled lab coat when Sam knocked on the door. Here for the test? You're late, man. Sam wrinkled his nose as the chemical smell of the lab tingled and burned in his nostrils. I wasn't in the office this week. Had a family thing. Mac nodded. Everyone's okay? They will be. He grabbed a clipboard, clapped it down on the sterile cloud blue counter. Well, full battery of tests for you this time. Got a, gonna need a urine sample after this. Sam sighed and rolled up his sleeve. Mac wrapped the length of rubber around his arm with one hand, snagged a small container full of vials with the other, both of the rough, almost graceful expertise. How many years have I been working here? Just some kind of punishment for the time off? Sorry, man. It's the holidays, so we're doing everyone. Gotta be extra careful around here this time of year. Mac shrugged. This'll sting. The needle went into Sam's arm hard and he hissed, even though he'd felt it a million times before. He watched his Mac carefully attached vial after vial to the nozzle on the needle's other end as they filled up with the thick red of his blood one by one. Like nobody would notice if one of us was on the sauce. Mac shrugged again. Hey, nobody noticed at Millen Tech or we wouldn't have had to reconstruct our server last month. Sam turned just too fast and the needle dug further into his arm. Ow, shit! That was drug related? Yep, one of the QA guys was on Bliss. He decided the security on the upgrade was good enough. Almost offed himself when they fired him because he'd been so proud of the work and they'd taken away his stash. Madison's talking about monthly tests instead of quarterly now. Shit, Sam said again. Bruises from Mac's bedside manner every month just to prove he was clean enough to do his own job. Soon it would be him and not Liz the cops were questioning about abuse. The idea rankled. The company didn't trust his judgment that far, but it was in his contract. It was in all their contracts, probably even Max. These days he wasn't going to find a job that paid anything without a lab clause in the contract. The needle slipped out of his arm with a little jerk. Mac undid the rubber tubing and deftly applied a band-aid where the needle had been. So, drop a urine sample off at the nurse's station and you're free to go. Sam picked up the little clear cup from his stack on the counter and slid it into his pocket. Thanks. No problem. Mac gathered up the full vials and started to label them in his messy doctor's hand. Gordon, Sam, 1217. Want to grab something at the pub tonight? Kim's working late. Sam shook his head. Like I said, family thing. Still need to keep an eye on it. Oh, yeah. You give me a call if you need anything, right? He said it so flatly, Sam was almost surprised. The best nonchalant bastard of a friend I've ever had. Maybe I should have said yes. And if I don't see you before then, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Sam said, headed for the washroom. <clears throat> Liz was asleep when he got home, curled up in his bed looking just like she had as a kid. The stress lines were smoothed out of her face. It wasn't artificially happy, just peaceful. Sam sat down next to her, closed his eyes, tried to reproduce the look on her face. He smoothed his face to calmness, leaned back on the bit of mattress that wasn't covered with her sleep-heavy body. His thoughts slowed down, quieted. The warmth of the bed and the warmth of his own body melted into one. Maybe this is how she felt with the bliss, sleepy and secure, totally unaware of anything outside her own body, slow, content, hibernatory, consciousness bleeding into everything around. He jolted, no, wake up, live. Sam sat up and his hands were shaking. Liz was still fast asleep, her breathing even and steady. He must reach out to pull the blankets over her. Instead, he stood up and went to put on the kettle. Monday, Christmas coming, family around for the first time in years. Sam came home with a turkey and trimmings, and trimmings, a bottle of wine and a store-bought chocolate cake, just in time to see Elizabeth stuff something in her mouth. He kept his hands steady, put down the groceries, and composed his face before turning to look at her. Hi, Liz. What do you have there? She shifted on the couch, curling her knees up against her chest, clouding her too thin face away. I had a headache. She hadn't answered the question. Took a few steps toward her slowly. Okay. What do you have there? 
She swallowed. Nothing. He dove for the couch, grabbed for her wrist, and wrestled the nothing out of her hand. She yelped, screamed. He pulled away and unfolded it into his hand. It was a packet of paper. Inside it were three little pink pills. He stared for a moment and then crumpled it in his fist. Liz, where did you get this? His tears started to seep into her eyes. I need it. No, you don't. His voice was so patient, more than he felt. Daddy voice, reasonable and rational. Maybe Dad could have dealt with Liz like this. She's always been his baby. You can live without it. She made another snatch at the packet. But I don't want to. It's, how can you be so unhappy? I can't do it, Sam. You're going to have to make your own happiness, he said. So prosaic. But he'd made his own. Good job. Nice home. Nobody else had given it to him. That was for sure. I can't, she almost wailed. Sam felt a momentary surge of guilt. It was true. She probably couldn't. She'd wait forever for her handsome prince, her protector, or keeper. Don't think that. To make everything okay. And when nobody did, she just went back to it time after time after time. He knew why he still hadn't called Mom. She and Liz hadn't spoken in ten years. Seeing Liz like this would break his mother's heart. Why hadn't he taken her to the doctor? Her eyes strayed to the crumpled packet in his hand one more time. Would his own big sister jump him to get at the stash? Sam hesitated for one long moment, and he strode to the window, slid it open, flung the packet of, pa of paper fifty-three stories down into the alley below. Elizabeth's mouth dropped open. You, you asshole. Sam slid the window shut. It's for your own good, he said, and managed to keep his voice even. You hate me. You've always hated me. You think you're better than I am. I'm not the addict here, okay? Shit, shouldn't have said that. Addict, she hissed. You're addicted to your own fucking holier-than-thou pain. You want me on it, too. Elizabeth uncurled like a snake, eyes glittering. Well, excuse fucking me if I don't want to hurt all the time. I just want to be happy, okay? That's all I want. No condo, no money, no goddamn leather jacket, and Sam got to his feet. Elizabeth, no, you listen to me. How dare you say I don't have a right to be happy? Sam felt his own eyes narrowing. Who said you did? Happiness isn't a right, Liz. It's a privilege. You earn it. It's not something people just get on a silver platter. You work for it, okay? <laughs> right, she snorted. Work and be good and don't talk in school. Thou shalt be rewarded from on high. It doesn't work like that, baby brother. You don't know shit about life, Liz. <clears throat> You're the one who's full of... She hesitated, frowned. I... One by one, her muscles relaxed. A serene smile spread across her face, then started to intensify. She tightened her hands and looked down at the vase in her hand, ran her hand over its painted pattern. She sat the vase down on the floor, started to examine it from every angle, touching, smelling, drinking it in. Her eyes were wide with delight. Look, she breathed. Sam drew a rugged breath and let it out. He needed to put the groceries away before they got too warm or they wouldn't have a Christmas dinner. And he needed a dinner for tonight and to call his mother. Someone to watch Elizabeth when he went to work tomorrow in case he needed a doctor. He was in over his head. Didn't dare take her to the hospital. Social services would step in and he'd never see her again. Mom would find out and she'd never forgive him. Hadn't given up on her yet. He wasn't going to now. Sam picked up the phone and punched a few numbers. Mac? Sam Gordon. No, it's just, you know how you said I could call if, if, I need a favor. Mac arrived with a sharp knock on the door and his usual air of wrinkled competence, even though the lab coat, had been, lab coat had been replaced with a huge gray trench coat. You rang? I got a problem, Sam said. It's my sister. I can't take her to a hospital. Mac's face went serious and sharp. Let me see. He shouldered past Sam into the apartment and regarded Elizabeth where she sat on the floor, still staring at the painted vase. What are the symptoms? Sam shut and locked the door behind him, trying not to fidget. I, it's, he swallowed, bliss. Mac frowned, not anger, but concentration. Here, let me see. He opened his bag and pulled out instruments, gauze, bottle of liquid that smelled sterile and sharp. Elizabeth giggled when the needle went into her arm, and she watched the blood spurt into the vials with focused fascination. What's your name? Mackenzie, he said with a parent's indulgent smile and changed the vial. I work with your brother. 
She clapped her hands in delight. Sham sh Sam shook his head. If I can just keep her away from it. Not that simple, man. How much do you know about bliss? Makes you a spineless vegetable, he muttered. Matt gave him a measuring look and eased the second vial from the needle, replacing it with a third. Bliss isn't like some of the other stuff. It's neurological, chemical stimulation of the parts of your brain that regulate sleep and processing speed and such, that regulate feelings. It suppresses the negative emotion parts of the brain, some of the logic centers, and a dependency forms. It's like the daredevil theories about adrenaline addiction. The brain needs the chemical after a while. Matt carefully labeled the vial Jane Doe 1221. <clears throat> Emotion is chemical, he said. It's genuine, ha genuine happiness they're feeling, as far as we know. Fake happiness, pill happiness, bullshit. Mac, he said, what the hell am I going to do? Mac shrugged and started to pack his bag. Look, let me get this to the lab. I have an idea about fixing this. I don't know if I'll have to do a spinal tap, but this should be a start. Mac rubbed the bridge of his nose beneath the glasses and sighed. It's been a long time since I did research, he said. But there was excitement in his voice. He zipped up his bag and looked Elizabeth up and down one more time. How she rubbed the bandage on her arm. How she fidgeted and plucked at her hair, her clothes, everything with a kind of satisfied glee. It's not even supposed to be a street drug. It's an antidepressant. Guess it just proves people will abuse anything. Hey, Sam said, she's not a junkie. It was hard for her, okay? Yeah, Mac replied. It's hard for everyone. All the words in Sam's mouth jumped back down his throat. Mac went to the door and unlocked it. Look, I'll let you know by Wednesday if there's anything I can do. He turned with a lopsided smile, punched Sam in the arm. Get some sleep, huh? Sam managed to push out one word before his throat closed again. Good night. Good night, Mac said, and then he was gone. Elizabeth stared at him, doll eyes wide, and her smile fixed upon, upon her face. Let's play a game. Want to play? On Wednesday morning, there was a memo on his desk. Report to the lab. Sam tucked his briefcase under the desk. He stuffed the paper in his pocket, heart accelerating to a mile a minute. He went down the stairs, dodging the herds of co-workers, dragging themselves up to their own cubicles to the sound of canned holiday cheer. Mac's head snapped up when he pushed the door open. Took you long enough? What have you got? Sam panted. He sank into the chair where Mac usually took blood, grateful for its presence for the first time in his life. Mac didn't shrug. In fact, his stare was almost as focused as Elizabeth's. Before I go into this, I want you to know these aren't tested or approved by any kind of authority. I mix them in my basement. I'll deny whatever the hell I have to. I don't know what might go wrong, but they should work, in theory. Are you sure you want to do this? This was irresponsible. This was wildly irresponsible. It was better than social services. It was better than this going on again and again. The tears, the withdrawal, the inevitable broken lock and stolen cash and slide back into unknowing stupor. It was better than not knowing. Sam nodded. Matt dug into his pocket and pulled out a dark tinted pill bottle. The prescription label was blank. He opened it with a loud pop and there were five little pink pills inside. Here's your silver bullet. Well, pink. Sam raised an eyebrow. Mac, that's just the drug. Ah, he said, looks like, huh? Consider that a perk. It's for patient cooperation, let's say. If my guess is right, these little suckers will stimulate the parts of the brain that Bliss is turning off. We can get some balance going again, if I'm right. I'll trust you, Sam said. My head's spinning already. I mean, how do you know all this shit? Think I wanted to be a lab monkey my whole life, Mac snorted. Your piss is fascinating. Some of us trained, uh, trained as scientists so we could, you know, do science. Sam swallowed. There was a moment of silence in which he thought about apologizing and discarded that because it would embarrass Mac. Wondered why he'd never figured Mac was that smart. Wondered how many industries the pharmaceutical question really had affected. Figured maybe he was lucky to have wanted to go into software and not music or art or science or social work. Mac pressed the bottle into Sam's palm. Five little pink pills inside rattled quietly against the tinted plastic. Here's your prescription. Use it wisely and use it well. Don't say I never did anything for you. He blinked. So if it's that easy to get people unhooked, why didn't... Mac shook his head. He looked almost pitying. You really are naive, man. Get back to your desk before Madison starts wondering. Let me know how it goes. 
Yeah, Sam said. Thanks so much. He slipped the pill bottle into his pocket. It shook and danced with every step he took back to the office. When Sam got home, he could tell Liz had been out. They ate dinner in sullen silence. Once she fell asleep, he went hunting for her stash. Six pink pills went out of the folded napkin in the stereo speaker. Five pink pills went back into it. For a day, there was relative peace. Sam managed to make his excuses to Mom and, and cook them Christmas dinner. The old-fashioned kind where he fumbled through an ancient recipe book, left the turkey in the oven too long, and bought eggnog. It was hard to take his eyes off Liz, even to cook. Of course, it was too soon for any changes to show, if there were to be any changes. The way she held her glass at dinner looked just different enough. The way he remembered her doing it before it was just fuzzy enough. He shook his head. She might get off the drug, but he was going to drive himself crazy. She was quiet throughout dinner. Not the angry quiet of last week, but almost pensive, content. It was vaguely unnerving. She offered to do the dishes. She offered to warm up the eggnog, and he let her just to get a break from staring at her face for a few minutes. He sat down on the black leather couch and stared at the black and silent television instead, stark against the white walls, reflecting across the street's Christmas lights through the window in a weird blur of green and red. Sam, something was wrong. She'd found out. She was gonna, she was gonna run out again and he'd never find her in time. He stumbled over his own feet and practically jumped into the kitchen. She was sitting at the table, there was a mug before the empty black wood chair across from him. Eggnog's ready. She was looking into her mug, and there were faint worry lines creasing her forehead. Had she figured it out? What would he say if she did? He took a long swallow of the eggnog. Another. Something small and solid went down his throat. Sam almost gagged, but it was gone. He could almost feel it wending its way down into his stomach. Liz, what the hell? Oh, come on. You need to loosen up, baby brother. Always so serious. It's not good to be so serious this time. That's how you end up all perfect and empty and you don't know where it all went. The warmth going down through his body started to burn. He coughed, then harder, so he could force it up. But it was gone. It was in him, and she put it. You put something in my drink. Liz, how could you? She shrugged. You're always so sad. I don't want you to be sad. I'm the big sister. I'm supposed to take care of you, right? She'd given him bliss. He's going to fail his next drug test. He's going to turn into an addict. It fry his brain. But it wasn't bliss, of course. Max medication. Sam's eyes went wide as his mug crashed to the floor. His knees buckled. His body hit the black and white tile with a thud. All those thoughts went through his head at once, and that one did too. He realized he could see Spectre in the fluorescent track lighting. He could see the minute flaws in the floor tiles. He could feel the humming of the fridge in his back and calculated its frequency. And through that calculate, calculate, calculate just how cold of a temperature it was maintaining. Two degrees higher than it should. Of course, that was why the milk had spoiled last week. It was incredible. He thought he heard Liz scream. He couldn't sleep. Thoughts burned through his mind, one after the other, hissing like race cars he could only perceive a second after they had already passed. Liz had carried, no, dragged him to bed feel soft pillow pressure, texture springs. He could calculate his weight from how hard the mattress pushed back into his spine, a few equations he'd forgotten from first-year physics. The zipper of his suitcase, the rustle of his phone book's pages, then Mac was there. Sam could hear his voice somewhere above, blurred with speed, refracted into frequencies. He could pinpoint how far away it was from the acoustics alone. The thoughts crowded his head like they never had. Every bad night of worried insomnia in the world compacted into one little pill. He remembered things long forgotten and pushed by the wayside. Flavors, feelings, all fuzzy and half there, almost as if they were a dream. I've been sleeping my whole life. I've only come awake just now. He couldn't sleep now. He was alive. Phone ring. Liz's voice, worried, with a strain of snappish stress he hadn't heard in forever time in which he viewed the entirety of a Picasso exhibit he'd seen at 14 all over again, listened to symphonies, calculated his annual budget, realized what he needed to get, pro get promoted and planned it all out. Then more voices, his mom's voice, hysterical. This is all your fault, you stupid shit. His, drain st his brain started planning damage control. If mom was here, then Liz must have called. So they must have been talking. It didn't sound good. It sounded really bad. And there it was again. 
I should have known you should have a, a I should have known you you should have been responsible. You were older and your father would never have put up with with he would have dealt with you. And they were gonna fight. That couldn't happen because he had to keep the peace one way or another until he could understand her, maybe make mom understand her, so there would be peace in the house. And it was Christmas for God's sake, even if statistically that was the worst time her the worst time for families. Didn't Mac say something the other day about that? And oh yeah, Mac was here, pushing something into his mouth. You could tell because Mac always smelled like those damn cleaners they used in the lab, stingy and sharp. Had to swallow or he'd choke and throw up and people died like that. And then, joy. It rocketed through his veins for just an instant before the centrifuge of his brain slowed, before his eyes could open, before his heart stopped pounding hard enough to break his ribs, as his face hovered above him, tight with strain. Sam, his mouth worked experimentally. Um, oh God, tears sprung from her eyes and spattered his chest. Oh God, you're okay. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'll never touch this shit again. I swear, I swear. You're goddamn right you'll never touch. Mmm, he said to his mother. His eyes closed and the darkness took him. When he woke up again, Mac was sitting beside the bed. His eyes were far away again, the scientist's eyes, observing, calm. Not at all like he'd probably been pulled away from a Christmas dinner of his own. Was Mac even Christian, dumped into the middle of a family fight? They were fighting. He could hear Liz screaming through the solid bedroom door. He could hear his mother's angry, low, cold tone sneaking beneath it. His eyes fluttered. His thoughts were so damn slow. Why couldn't he think? Sam, Mac stood up. Fingers pressed against his forehead and they were freezing. Shit, you're running a temperature. You need liquids. Sorry, he squeezed out. Mac was already out the door. He came back after what felt like an eternity with a mug and blankets, propped Sam's limp, Sam's limp body upwards, held the mug up to his lips. Sam sipped hot chocolate, just warm enough to feel good, just cool enough so it didn't burn his tongue. Chocolate releases endorphins into the bloodstream, his mind whispered. We like it because it's chemical. After a few more sips, he could hold it himself in steadying hands. Are they? Mac shrugged, but his eyes were dark. I don't know what's normal around your house. They're fighting. Your sister's pretty torn up. She's a smart woman. Addicts don't usually have short-term memory retention that good, especially for names. He paused. You're lucky, man. She said she wasn't going to take it anymore. Yeah, I told them about the meds. It works, the pills. It felt, he shook his head, fast. Mac's impassive, impassive doctor face twitched just a little. That's something. He stood before Sam could get a good look at his face. I'll go get your sister. I have to get home. It's almost two in the morning. He was probably worried sick. How'd you come up with that so fast? I mean, Sam paused as the doctor face slipped. There was, there was a wistfulness, a hunger in Mac's eyes that he'd never seen before. It's been a long time since I did research, Mac said quietly, but I always keep my notes. He opened the door and then shut it again behind him. A few quiet words. Sam caught, don't fuss, fragile, untested, before Liz came in and carefully sat herself down. Sam huddled under the blankets and cupped his fingers around the mug of hot chocolate. They were freezing cold. They moved so slowly, almost as slow as the thoughts in his head. They didn't want to whimper or cry or scream. He'd been moving so fast. Now it was gone. He was empty. Everything was still the same, slow and sticky and living in a dream. A nightmare of illusion and stupidity and not understanding a damn thing. What? Liz said sharply. He realized he'd been speaking out loud. He was still muttering under his breath. Sam shook himself and took another sip from his mug. It was shiny black. His sheets were crisp white. Both were hurting his eyes. The whole apartment was hurting his eyes. Sam, her voice was anxious, raw-edged. Nothing, he said. Nothing. Hours passed. He drank. He stood up. He lay down. Liz took his temperature. His mother fussed and wept and scowled, despite whatever Mac had said to them. Finally, he was alone in bed with the night graying into winter dawn, Christmas Day. He couldn't sleep. Liz was going to take the meds and get off the bliss. She and Mom were talking again. Talking loudly, yeah, but talking. He didn't need to keep her secret from Mom anymore. He could go back to his job and his life, and it was good. You know, it was going to be okay. There was something missing. He should have been happy. Instead, there was this, just this slow, dull thickness swirling around his brain. 
He could live like this. It's like having his legs cut off. He had such capacity, such ability. He'd been so himself. He was a drug, Sam. It wasn't real. You know it wasn't real. And why do I feel so? He asked the walls. Curled up on the floor of his bedroom in a sleeping bag, Liz stirred and rolled over in her sleep. He wasn't going to be an addict. Maybe he did think he was better than Liz, because he could function without fake happiness just fine. So he could function without fake knowledge, too. He would go back to work and back to his life and forget this had happened, bury it away. He would never touch anything so strong as a martini ever again. It didn't matter if he forgot things, if there were things he never figured out or didn't know, if there ended up being limits to his own intelligence. It felt like being alive. I could remember how Dad's aftershave smelled. He shoved the thought away. He knew exactly where Liz's stash was. Three little pills wrapped in a napkin, stuffed into the back of his stereo speaker. He slid out of bed, opened the white door on silent white hinges, padded across the living room, past his sleeping mother on the black couch, to the black wall unit with the black stereo. One hand dug in, removed one little pink pill from the folded napkin, placed it in his warren. Maybe he'd need it someday. Maybe there'd be a problem he couldn't solve. It was wise, he reasoned, to save something like this for contingencies, for emergencies, for a rainy day. Sam ghosted back into his bedroom, eased himself shakily into bed with a careful glance at Liz. She didn't even twitch. No peace on her face this time, just sheer blank exhaustion. With or without the bliss, she was never really going to be happy. People made their own happiness didn't get handed to them on a silver platter or in a little pink pill. He'd made his own happiness. He tucked his pill into a tissue, wedged it in the back of his nightstand drawer where the, where the particle board and pieces met. It would be safe there if he needed it. He rolled over and fell asleep just as the sun started to rise. After the holidays, Liz moved back in with Mom. The pills had worked. She didn't need the bliss anymore. At least her body didn't. The mother still called him every few days, worried, tense, frustrated with the idea of a teenager she hadn't seen for 10 years and hadn't been able to handle even then. She cried at night, Mom said. She went to work and she went out with guys every so often, always checked out for drugs and home by 11. There wasn't that light in her eyes anymore, Sammy. Just, she just isn't how she was as a little girl. Sam would listen and nod and uh-huh, I understand. We have to understand. She's not going to be the same. She'll never be the same, Mom just have to love her how she is. But she was such a perfect little girl, his mother would say, and trail off confused. Sam went back to work. He remembered enough of his plan to write it down and got promoted. Mac changed jobs too, but into a new department, chemical research and development, a department funded by some uncanny new developments R&D had reached. By rights, it should have taken years to write a programming language like that. Sam didn't see him in the lab anymore. The lab test stayed quarterly. Every so often, someone had an unexpected few days off after lab day. Nobody could quite understand it because they seemed normal, right? Days like that, Sam went home and his thoughts felt slow as mud. He stared at lines of code and couldn't think. Something cold and empty started gnawing at his guts. The black and white tiles, the white sheets, the black electronics hurt his eyes and head and heart. It was just too damn much for one person to take. Days like that, Sam went into his bedroom and dug a ratty tissue out of the back of his nightstand drawer, unwrapped it until the little pink pill rested in his hand and stared at it for hours. So long as he had that little pink pill, it would be okay. He could use it if he needed it, to be fast again, be happy and sharp and powerful again, and everything would be all right. He had it right there, just in case of an emergency. Then he would wrap it up and put it back and make some hot chocolate.